Hi everyone, my name is Maxim Farsibourg and today I'm going to tell you about a joint project with Bram Petri in which we prove geometric inequalities from trace formulas. So before I start, I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me. Thank you. All right, so the end result we prove uh, together with Bram is the following. Uh, we show that among all closed hyperbolic surfaces of genus 3, the multiplicity of the first positive eigenvalue of the Laplacian, which we denote by M1, is maximized by the Klein quartic, where uh, the multiplicity is equal to 8. So what is the Klein quartic? It's maybe best known for being the smallest Hurwitz surface, uh, which is a surface, hyperbolic surface, uh, whose isometric group has size equal to 84 times the genus minus one, which is the largest possible. Um, and the context of this theorem is as follows. So there's a long chain of uh, inequalities proven for the multiplicity uh, of the first positive eigenvalue, starting with uh, Chang, then uh, improved by Besson, then by Nadirajvili, and then finally, the latest uh, uh, general uh, improvement was due to Sevenek, who showed that M1 is always bounded above by 2G plus 3 for any Riemannian uh, surface of genus G. And so for G equals 3, this comes out equal to 9. Uh, and so our theorem is an improvement uh, from 9 to 8, but we have to restrict to closed hyperbolic surfaces only. Um, and uh, maybe I should mention that uh, 7x upper bound also holds not only for the Laplacian, but also for any Schrodinger operator on a surface. So it's a very topological result, uh, whereas we need to use geometry to uh, improve on this bound. And also regarding the Klein quartic itself, uh, there had been previous results before by Joseph Cook, who showed that the multiplicity was between 6 and 8, and then we just improved the lower bound uh, up to 8. All right, so uh, like very often in math, uh, this isn't the problem that we actually set out to solve. Uh, what happened is that we, uh, we found a hammer called the Selberg trace formula, and then we looked around for nails to hit with this hammer, and this was it. Uh, so what did we want to, to do in the beginning? Uh, we started to look at closed GD6 and, and lengths of closed GD6, and this is what we were interested in. Uh, but then there's a relationship between that and the eigenspectrum of the Laplacian that goes through the Selberg trace formula. So instead of telling you the you know, details of the proof of this theorem, I want to tell you the, the story of how we, uh, we ended up there, uh, starting with the problem that motivated us. So the motivating question for me is, what are the roundest shapes out there? And of course, that depends on what shapes we're considering and what roundest means. So one classical example, Example of this is the isoparametric problem, which asks uh, which planar figure of a given parameter has the largest possible area. And as you know, the answer is uh, a round disk. And, uh, but another way to formulate the problem, instead of fixing the parameter to be equal to something, uh, we can consider the isoparametric ratio, which is the ratio of the parameter squared divided by the area. And then the initial problem uh, is equivalent to minimizing this quantity, um, which makes the shape as round as possible. So now, what if you want to generalize this problem to other surfaces besides planar domains? Uh, for example, closed surfaces that may not have any boundary at all, then what you need to do is replace this parameter by another one-dimensional measurement on the surface. And there's many possible candidates for this. Uh, you could use the diameter or the Cheeger constant of your surface. But I'm going to choose to work with the systole, uh, which is defined as the length of the shortest non-contractible closed curve in the surface. So note that uh, a shortest non-contractible closed curve is necessarily uh, a closed GD sec, uh, but the converse is false. So you could have a closed GD sick that 
is contractible. So uh, for example, you could have a bubble forming on your surface and the closed UV stick could bound that bubble. But if you have non-positive curvature, then any closed curve, uh, closed UD stick is non-contractible. So uh, an equivalent way to define the systole is to define it as, as the shortest closed, length of the shortest closed UD stick. Um, so now the systolic ratio is defined as the systole squared divided by the area. So once again, it's a scaling invariant uh, because the units cancel out. But one difference with the previous problem is now this quantity is not bounded below. So you, if you fix the area of your surface, it's always possible to send the systole to zero by just pinching a curve on the surface. On the other hand, the, this quantity is bounded above. So that's perhaps uh, not so obvious. Uh, but in fact, there's a theorem of Gromov that says if you define the analogous quantity for n-dimensional manifolds, so syst uh, as systole to the power n divided by volume, uh, then there's a universal constant in each dimension such that the systolic ratio of any essential uh, n-manifold is bounded above by that constant. And uh, so it doesn't matter what essential manifold mean, uh, but suffice it to say that any surface of genus at least one is essential. And so there's a global upper bound for the systolic ratio of any closed surface. Um, and even though this is bounded, uh, we only know the maximizer in one case, namely in genus one. So in that case, the maximizer is the regular, the flat regular hexagonal torus. So just take a regular hexagon in the Euclidean plane and then glue opposite sides by translation as depicted on the right here. Um, and then uh, it's a theorem of Lovner that this metric is optimal for this problem. So it maximizes this systolic ratio. Here, the systoles are given by uh, the, the closed GD6 uh, that go across from one side to the opposite side in a straight line. So there's three distinct homotopy classes of such shortest closed GD6 here. And already in genus two, we don't know which Riemannian metric maximizes this systolic ratio. So maybe this problem is too hard. So how can we make it uh, easier? Well, we can restrict the class of Riemannian metrics that we look at. And I like hyperbolic geometry. So um, it's natural to restrict our attention to hyperbolic surfaces. Uh, so if, if in that case, um, if you have a surface of constant curvature minus one, then by the Gauss-Bonnet formula, the area is normalized to be four pi times the genus minus one. So maximizing the systolic ratio is really just the same as maximizing the systole. Um, and it was proved by Jenny uh, that the Balza surface uh, maximizes the systole among all hyperbolic surfaces of genus two. So what is the Balza surface? Uh, you can get it by taking a regular octagon uh, in the hyperbolic plane with interior angles equal to pi over four, and then gluing opposite sides together in a similar pattern as for the regular hexagonal torus from before. Uh, so all the eight corners come into a single point, and so the total angle around that point uh, comes out to two pi, so we get a nice hyperbolic metric on there. Uh, and the surface turns out to be the, the most symmetric surface in genus two. Uh, it's tiled by two, three, eight triangles, and the isometric group acts transitively on these triangles. Um, okay, so I wanna say um, a few words about how the proof of this theorem goes. Uh, I learned this from a preprint by Christophe Bavard. Uh, the original paper by Jenny is in German, but I can't read German. So I don't know if it's the same proof, but it, it's, it's a nice proof uh, nevertheless. Uh, so how does it work? Well, the main idea is that any uh, surface of genus two is hyperelliptic, which means that there's an isometric involution such that the quotient by this involution uh, is homeomorphic to a sphere. And this involution is gonna have six cone points called the uh, six fixed points called the value stress points. And the images by these fixed points uh, are going to be cone points uh, of angle pi. Uh, 
and then anywhere else, you know, the hyperbolic metric descends. And so you get a nice hyperbolic metric on the quotient sphere, except for these corners of angle pi. And the observation to make is that if you take balls of radius systole over four centered at these six cone points, uh, then these are going to have disjoint interiors. And the reason is that if you could uh, make a connection between two cone points, um, uh, if they overlap, then this would mean that you could make a con connection between two cone points of length less than systole over two. And then if you take the two distinct lifts of this connection to the, the covering surface, you get a close, a non-contractible close curve of length strictly uh, smaller than the systole, which is a contradiction. So these disks have disjoint interior, so they form a, a circle packing on your surface uh, with circles of equal radius. And then the goal was to maximize the systole, which is the same as maximizing the total area of these disks. But since the, the total area of the surface itself is fixed, uh, this is the same as maximizing the proportion uh, of area occupied by these disks. And then there's an old uh, theorem of Borowski, uh, which says that the area occupied by any disks uh, in a packing within its Voronoi cell, uh, namely the set of points that are closer to this cone point uh, than any other center uh, in the packing. So that's the Voronoi cell. So the density um, uh, there is bounded above by the density that you see uh, if you have a packing such that the, the circles are all arranged in tangent triples, as in this picture over there. And so from this, uh, you can deduce that in this case, for the Bolza surface, uh, so if you take the quotient by the hyperelliptic involution, what you get is a regular uh, octahedron, or looks like a regular octahedron, except that the faces are really hyperbolic triangles. Uh, but in any case, the combinatorics is such that the, the disks are all tangent in triples like this, uh, and therefore the, the maximal density is achieved. Uh, and from this, we deduce that this has the largest systole possible. So unfortunately, this argument doesn't extend in higher genus because uh, you know, a generic genus 3 surface uh, is not hyperelliptic. So there's no uh, sphere packing, or there's no disk packing that you can get from a collection of shortest closed geodesic on the surface because there's no natural choices of centers for the disks in this packing. So what can we do instead? Well, um, we can look at what other people have done in related fields. Um, so the study of the systolic ratio goes back much further um, to the study of lattices in Euclidean spaces, um, which is equivalent to studying flat tori. So what is a flat torus by definition is the quotient of Euclidean space by a lattice, and a lattice is just a subgroup generated by n linearly independent vectors. Um, so this uh, kind of stuff has been, the ge geometry of lattices has been studied since Minkowski at least, uh, and there's many, many things known about these. Um, so, and, uh, so here I want to explain what, uh, an another way to talk about the systolic ratio for flat tori or another quantity that this is equivalent to, um, namely the, the density of a certain uh, sphere packing once again. Uh, so the first observation is that the systole of a flat torus is equal to the minimal norm of a non-zero vector in the lattice. And the reason why this is true is that if you take any non-contractible closed curve in the flat torus, then you can lift it to the universal cover, which is Rn. And then the endpoints of this lift are going to be related by a non-trivial deck transformation. And the group of deck transformations is just the lattice gamma itself. Uh, so it means that the length of the curve is at least the distance between these two points, uh, which is equal to the norm of a vector a non-zero vector in the lattice. And conversely, if I take any 
non-zero vector in the lattice, then I can just take the straight line from the origin to that point, and that projects down to a closed geodesic uh, on my flat torus, whose length is equal to the norm of the starting vector. OK, so that, that proves the equality. And then the second observation is that if we take balls of radius systole over 2 uh, centered at each of the points in the lattice, then that forms a sphere packing, meaning that the interiors of these balls are uh, disjoint. And the argument here is uh, the same as in the, the previous case, basically. Uh, it's just the triangle inequality. So if you had two uh, of these disks that overlapped, it means you could find a path uh, that the distance between the centers of the corresponding disks would be strictly less than the systole. Uh, but this is impossible because the, the difference between the centers of the balls is a vector in the lattice. Um, okay, so here are two pictures of two uh, lattices in the plane together with the associated uh, sphere packings on the right hand side. And so now I can explain what I said in words earlier. So what is the density of this uh, of this sphere packing? Well, by definition is the proportion of volume occupied by the balls in the packing. And because this is uh, repeating, uh, we can it suffices to look at what happens is in a given fundamental domain um, and look at the proportion of volume occupied there. And so what you can take as a fundamental domain is, is any Voronoi cell centered at uh, any point in the lattice. Um, so again, the set of points closer to the center than to any other center. And so uh, the, the packing density is then just the volume of any ball in the packing uh, divided by the, the volume of the Voronoi cell that it is contained in. And then the volume of the ball is just the radius to the power n times the volume of the unit ball. And the radius is systole over 2. Um, so we get this formula here. And, uh, and also the other observation is that the volume of the Voronoi cell or any fundamental domain is just the volume of the quotient torus. So up to this constant volume of the unit ball divided by 2 to the power n, uh, the density is exactly equal to the systolic ratio, systole to the power n divided by volume. So maximizing one is really equivalent to maximizing the other. And this problem has been studied for by many people uh, since uh, very long. And so here is what is known about the problem. Uh, oh, so before I do this, let me point out that uh, if you look uh, at the pictures, um, so one observation to make is that uh, if you look at any sphere in the packing, the number of spheres that are tangent to it is exactly equal to the number of vectors in the lattice uh, that have minimal length. And this in turn uh, tells you that this is equal to, to the number of uh, distinct homotopy classes of uh, shortest closed GD6 in the quotient torus. Um, if you count orientation, uh, yeah, you have to, to count curves with different orientations as being distinct. Uh, anyhow, so this, um, the kissing number of, of uh, sphere packings has been, uh, is also a classical sort of problem to maximize this quantity. Uh, but this gives a way to define this quantity for uh, hyperbolic surfaces, for example, or any space uh, as just the number of distinct homotopy classes of shorted oriented closed curves. OK, so back to, to sphere packings. Um, what is known about this problem? So the densest uh, packings that come from lattices uh, are known in dimensions 1 to 8 and 24. Uh, and if you don't require that the packings come from lattices, then the problem becomes harder. And uh, then it's only known in dimensions 1, 2, 3, 8, and 24. Um, and you know, for the lattice case, the, the dimensions um, you know, 5, 6, and 8 have, have been known since the 1930s, I think. Uh, but dimension 24 is much more recent. Um, so I just want to point out that in, uh, so one possible approach uh, 
uh, for this problem is to list all local maximizers for the systolic ratio because there's a criterion for being a local maximizer in terms of the lattice. Um, and you can do program this on the computer and this has been done up to dimension eight. Uh, and then you can let the computer go through these local maxima, compute the systolic ratio or the packing density and just pick out the maximum. But uh, you know, this is not feasible in dimension 24 because the number of local maximizers uh, actually grows quite fast. Um, so what did people do? What's the story for dimension 24? Uh, this was, uh, for lattices, this was solved by Kohn and Kumar in 2009, where they proved that the leash lattice has optimal density among lattice packings. And then in 2017, Kohn, Kumar, Miller, Rachenko, and Vyazovska proved the maximality of this uh, sphere packing among all sphere packings in dimension 24. And this was after Vyazovska had uh, proved an analogous result in dimension eight. And both of these papers, uh, and including also the other paper by Vyazovska, they use a, a bound due to Kohn and Elkies. So I want to talk th about this uh, for a little bit because it, it's a beautiful uh, theorem and it's quite simple to state and prove. Uh, so it says the following. So if you have a continuous function from Rn to R, which is radial, meaning that it's invariant under rotations about the origin, uh, so that the value at any point only depends on the norm of that point. Uh, and also it needs to decay fast enough um, in a precise sense, which I'm not going to bother with. Uh, and then suppose also that there's the following conditions hold. So that F is non-positive outside the ball of radius two. Its Fourier transform is non-negative everywhere. Uh, and this is called uh, positive definite functions. Um, and also we require that the Fourier transform at the origin is positive. Then the packing density of any sphere packing with spheres of equal radius in Rn is bounded by the volume of the unit ball times f at zero divided by f hat at zero. Um, so this is true for all sphere packings, but uh, I'm just gonna tell you the proof for lattice packings because it's, it's easy. Um, so how does it go? The first step is to say, well, since packing density doesn't depend on scaling, we can rescale our lattice uh, so that the shortest non-zero vectors in the lattice have uh, length equal to two. So then uh, the radius of the spheres in the packing is then equal to one. And then what do we do? We apply the Poisson summation formula to our fu function f. Um, so what does this say? It says that the sum of the values of f at the points in the lattice is equal to one over the volume of the quotient torus times the sum of the values of, of the Fourier transform on the dual lattice. So this dual lattice, um, I'm going to write down the definition on the later slide, but it's the set of vectors in Rn whose dot product with the vectors in the original lattice gamma uh, are integers. Um, and this turns out to be a lattice, and this is what the Poisson summation formula says. So uh, if you believe this formula, then put this together with the inequalities we have. So uh, we scale things so that all the uh, points in the lattice, except for the origin, are outside the ball of radius two, uh, so that the, the values of the function are non-positive. Um, everywhere except perhaps at the origin. So we have f at the origin is bounded below uh, by the sum over all lattice points. And then use the Poisson formation, summation formula to equal this to the sum uh, over the values uh, of f hat on the dual lattice. And then uh, since f hat is non-negative, uh, we can discard all of the terms except for uh, the zero term. And then we get this inequality there. And then just recall from the previous slide that the packing density of a lattice packing is just the volume of any ball uh, in the lattice. And here uh, it's been scaled so that the, the balls have radius one. So it's the volume of the unit ball divided by the volume of the Voronoi cell that it occupies, which is the same as the volume of the quotient torus. And then just using the previous uh, uh, inequality uh, gives the desired result.
Okay, so this, this is all very nice, um, but now you need to find actual functions f and to, in order to turn this bound into an actual number. So how did Kahn and Elkies do this? Uh, what they did is they uh, looked at a certain class of function f um, of the form polynomial multiplied by uh, e to the minus x squared over two. And the reason to do this uh, is that it's easy to compute the Fourier transform of such functions. So there's something called Laguerre polynomials, uh, which have the property that if you take an odd degree Laguerre, uh, even degree Laguerre polynomial times the Gaussian, then uh, its Fourier transform is equal to itself. And if you take an odd uh, degree Laguerre polynomial times the Gaussian, then its Fourier transform is equal to minus itself. So these are eigenfunctions uh, for the Fourier transform with eigenvalues plus or minus one. Uh, and so if you take linear combinations of these, then uh, you know, it's, it's immediate to compute this Fourier transform, just flip uh, certain uh, uh, you know, factors of the linear combination and keep the others intact. Um, so, this gives a nice, a large class of functions to look at. It's, it's dense in the it, pretty much any space of functions uh, you consider. And um, so the last thing you need to do is, is to optimize over this space of functions. Or I, what I should say, the, the last thing you need to do is to make sure that the functions that you use satisfy the inequalities required. So these were sort of sign inequalities. And then Conan and Elkies do this by uh, forcing certain double zeros for f and its Fourier transform uh, in order for it not to change sign in the range that you want. Okay, so this together with numerical optimization uh, gave them some bounds, some quite good bounds. Um, so the result that they got is the curve uh, in the middle here, which is an improvement upon the previous best upper bound due to Rogers. And then the jagged curve below is uh, the plot of the densities of the best known sphere packings in each of these dimensions. So you see that the plots seem to touch in dimensions eight and 24. And the, the bound that they got in this paper was within you know, 10 to the minus, I don't know, eight of uh, the, the actual values. Um, and then what Vyazowska did was to actually find a, a function f that achieves the density of the E8 lattice on the nose. And then uh, that's what they did. She did again together with collaborators in dimension 24 to construct a function f that achieves exactly the, the packing density of the leech lattice. All right, so now the goal was to use these ideas uh, and or apply these ideas in a different context in the concept, context of hyperbolic uh, surfaces. And indeed, the so the tool that was used here was the Poisson summation formula, which is a form of, of trace formula. And there's different trace formula depending on uh, uh, different contexts. So for flat torus, it's the Poisson summation formula for a hyperbolic surface or a hyperbolic manifold of any dimension, there's the Selberg trace formula. And then there's also a formula for finite regular graphs called the Ahumada's trace formula. Uh, so before I list these trace formulas, here's a bit of notation. So C of X is gonna denote the set of homotopy classes of oriented closed GDSIC on in the space X. And one reason to consider oriented um, homotopy classes uh, rather than unoriented is that these are in correspondence with conjugacy classes uh, in the deck group or equivalently of, of non-trivial elements in the deck group or equivalently the fundamental group. Uh, the next piece of notation is given a geodesic uh, gamma, uh, L of gamma is uh, gonna denote its length. And then most importantly, delta is gonna be the Laplacian operator uh, acting on functions on X. And uh, this is defined as minus the divergence of the gradient. So there's a way to make sense of this uh, if, um, if X is a graph, uh, but there's also an alternative definition in terms of the adjacency matrix, if you prefer. Uh, 
so we're going to need the, the set of eigenvalues of the Laplacian, which I'm going to denote by sigma of x. And these are listed uh, repeatedly according to the multiplicity of the eigenvalues. And the multiplicity of an eigenvalue is defined as the dimension of the corresponding eigenspace. Um, so one, one maybe important remark is that um, zero is always an eigenvalue of the Laplacian corresponding to constant functions. Uh, and then uh, you know, all eigenvalues are real and they're also non-negative in this case. So that's why there's a minus there is just to make sure that this is a pos uh, positive definite operator. Okay. Uh, so what is an, a trace formula? A trace formula is some gadget that allows you to uh, translate information from the length spectrum, so the, the set of lengths of closed UD6 uh, on your space, to the eigenspectrum of the Laplacian on the same space. And so it's sort of a dictionary between these two worlds. Um, and the problems we've talked about so far was the, the systole, uh, which is the sh length of the shortest closed UD6 in the space X, uh, or the first entry in the length spectrum. And then the kissing number uh, was how many curves have this length, or in other words, what is the multiplicity of this uh, value in the length spectrum? So there's corresponding problems uh, on the spectral side. So lambda 1 is the first positive eigenvalue of the Laplacian, and m1 is its multiplicity. So the analogous problems in this world are to maximize these two quantities there. Um, OK. So I've already uh, mentioned the Poisson summation formula, uh, which is as follows. And there's a way to reinterpret this uh, formula in terms of closed GD6, as well as uh, eigenvalues of the Laplacian. So how do we do that? Well. Here I've written absolute. Uh, I've written norms inside uh, the function. So here, what I mean by f of absolute value of x, I just mean the value of f uh, any point on the sphere of uh, radius x, because I was assuming f to be radial. Uh, and then what we saw is that for any non-zero vector in the lattice, corresponds a closed GD sig on the torus. Um, and if, if you replace this with homotopic classes of closed GD sig, then it's a one-to-one -one correspondence. So if you take out the term f of 0, then the rest of the sum is, is really just the sum of uh, over all closed G, uh, homotopy classes of oriented closed GD sig of the values of f at the lengths of these closed GD sig. And then uh, on the other side, uh, the sum um, of f hat at the lengths of the dual vectors uh, we can express in terms of the eigenspectrum uh, of the Laplacian because there's an explicit formula for the eigenvalues of the Laplacian. So it turns out that these eigenvalues are all equal to 2 pi times the norm of a vector in the dual lattice quantity squared. Um, OK, so um, the sum over the the sum of the norms of, of the vectors in the dual lattice can be rewritten as the sum over the eigenvalues of f hat, not at the, at the eigenvalue itself, but just a mild transformation of it. So just take the square root of it, divide by 2 pi, and then we recover the norm of the vector y that we had before. OK. Um, and then there's one more modification. I, you can do to this formula by, so you can send f of 0 on the other side by subtracting. Uh, and then we can rewrite this slightly differently because uh, f is the Fourier transform of the Fourier transform. Uh, and the Fourier transform is a sort of integral. Uh, and then you can, uh, using the fact that the function is radial, you can uh, integrate in polar coordinates. And this is the formula that you get if you do this. So this is just an equivalent formula for f of 0. And the only reason I, I write it down is to make the analogy uh, with other trace formulas uh, more evident. So here is the Selberg trace formula for hyperbolic surfaces. Uh, again, you need some function. Now it's defined from r uh, to r. It needs to be even to decay fast enough 
And then we get some identity between a sum of the values of f on the length spectrum, but then with some weights uh, in front. And then this equates to a sum of the uh, values of, of the Fourier transform at some modification of the uh, eigenvalues. So here we need to take the square root of the eigenvalues minus a quarter. And then there's, again, some integral term at the end for correction. Uh, and so here, by the way, uh, if you've seen the, if you're familiar with the Selbeck trace formula, this might not be the version you're familiar with. So it depends on what convention you use for the Fourier transform. And there's many different conventions in use. So lastly, uh, for finite regular graphs, there's Aumata's trace formula. I'm not going to read through. Uh, it just looks very similar. Again, you have a weighted sum over the length spectrum and then some sum over the eigen spectrum with modification and the integral term. Um, okay. And by the way, there's a, you know, here for, um, for flat tori, we have an explicit correspondence between, uh, between the length spectrum and the eigen spectrum given by a formula. Uh, for a hyperbolic surface, there's no surfaces, there's no you know, explicit formula that tells you given the, the length spectrum, how do you compute the eigen spectrum and vice versa. But it is true that one determines the other. And this is a theorem of Huber. And the way you prove this was using the Selberg trace formula. So this, this, uh, this identity, if you use enough test functions f, it is enough to sort of tell everything from one side uh, from the other side. OK, so. Uh, now, how do we use this Selberg trace formula uh, for hyperbolic surfaces to prove inequalities about uh, the invariants that we're interested in, which were the systole, the kissing number, the first positive eigenvalue, or its multiplicity? Well, we just sort of apply the same sort of idea as in the conan elkies theorem. Uh, just write down the formula and require particular inequalities on F or its Fourier transform uh, in order that something comes out. And so here are four theorems uh, that give you bounds on these four invariants. And they, they just look very similar to the conan uh, uh statement. So there's some, some requirements on f and f hat. Uh, so here, f being admissible just means that it, it's even and decays fast enough. Uh, yes. And so. And I've on purpose, I've made the statements of the theorem smaller and smaller because you're not meant to read the details of what they say. But you know, the first uh, is enough to give you a sample of uh, the flavor of these results. So given a function that satisfies certain inequalities, uh, then we can get some upper bound for the systole. And then similarly for the other invariants. Um, and then the... the the proof is slightly different from the conan elke theorem in, um, in the sense that what we did there was uh, we did the rescaling first, which we there's no we don't do this here, uh, and also in this case it's uh, at least in cases the first two theorems it's a proof by uh, contradiction. So um, what you do is you suppose that there exists a hyperbolic surface X whose systole is strictly bigger than R, then write down the Selberg trace formula, and then you prove that a certain number is strictly less than itself, which is a contradiction. Uh, so there's no such surface x. Okay, and then how do we find, again, functions that give us good uh, numbers for these bounds? Well, we apply a similar, very similar strategy as Cohn and Elkies. We look at the same class of functions and then impose double roots so that there's no change of signs where we don't want them there to be. So uh, what do the results look like? Uh, they look like this. So here are the bounds we obtained for the systole. So our bounds uh, are given by the curves in blue in the following plots. Um, and then the previous best upper bound is indicated in red. And then the best known examples uh, for these invariants, the, the hyperbolic surfaces such that this particular invariant is as large as possible uh, as known, let's say. Uh, are depicted by the green curve. 
So for the syslog, we obtain this. So we obtain an improvement on Bavar's bound. And I, here I'm lying a little bit in genus two here. I didn't write Bavar's bound, uh, but it's really, I guess it's Jenny's bound, which Bavar we proved <laughs> differently. But I'm really, the upper curve, I'm really talking about a different proof, a different bound due to Bavor on the systole. Uh, okay, uh, so we have a slight improvement there, which seems to be additively uh, uh, an additive Im improvement uh, everywhere. Uh, and I should say, so here, so I talked about numerical uh, optimization to find up the best possible functions to get good bounds out of this, but I should point out that um, you know you can make these results rigorous. So it's computer assisted proofs, but they're actual proofs. So the computer can certify for you that the functions do satisfy these required inequalities, and that you can uh, you know certify that the number say the number r or the upper bound that you get is a rigorous upper bound uh, from this. So these are not just numerics, they are rigorous numerics. Okay, um, so maybe unfortunately, um, you know, the blue curve doesn't touch any uh, point on the green, green curve, so we're not as lucky as in the Taurus case. Uh, so there's not going to be a, uh, someone that comes up and finds the, the precise function f that, that achieves this, unless you know, unless we, we didn't optimize enough <laughs> yet or uh, good enough surfaces haven't been found, but that, that seems perhaps unlikely. Um, okay, for the kissing number, we obtained this. Uh, and here I've normalized the, uh, the y-axis by dividing the kissing number by genus squared and multiplying by log g. And the reason I did this is that uh, it's a theorem of Parlier that the kissing number is always is bounded by a constant times genus squared divided by log g for any uh, closed hyperbolic surface of genus g. And in fact, in a different project with Rem, uh, we gave a new proof of Parlier's theorem using the Selberg trace formula by cooking up some functions f uh, that did uh, what we wanted. Um, by hand. So instead of using the computer, we just found a sequence of, of uh, test functions f that gave this bound. And then we the constant we obtained is slightly better than the Parlier's. And uh, you can sort of see this. I think our constant is something in the uh, neighborhood of 60 or something like this. And if we let the computer go, uh, then you see that the actual constant is is maybe smaller than 20 in reality. So the functions we found by hand are not as good as the functions that the computer can find. Um, so here, it, for a small genus, uh, Parlier's bound is not the best uh, known, so there's better bounds. Well, in genus two, the maximizer of the kissing number is known. Uh, it's, again, the Bolza surface, and this is a theorem of Schmutz. And then, uh, you know, the, so it turns out that uh, shortest closed GD6 pairwise intersect at most once. And uh, the question of how many closed curves you can pack on the surface su such that this holds is a topological question that has been studied by many groups of people. Uh, and so there's, there's sort of topological upper bounds due to melistine uh, Riven and Theron in genus three, and then in genus four, um, uh, this is beaten by a bound of Pritichki, uh, and then eventually, uh, you know, Parlier's bound uh, gets better than these uh, these upper bound these topological bounds, uh, but in the small range, it's not. Anyhow, uh, the next plot is for. The first eigenvalue lambda one. So again, the best known upper bound uh, in this case is due to Uber. And our bound seems to be a, a quite good improvement on this. Uh, well, actually, so the best bound in, in the short range is due to Uber. And then in long, later on in the range, I think the best upper bound is due to Cheng. Um, and in this case, there's not so many known uh, lower bounds or examples where lambda one has been computed. Uh, so 
there's computations in the paper by Stromayer and Yuski, and also in the thesis by Joseph Cook. Um, but for example, there's no uh, computed examples beyond genus four. Okay, uh, and now there's no plot for M1 uh, because, so I lied a little bit. So I said that um, we get theorems that give us upper bounds for these invariants, uh, but the upper bounds for the kissing number uh, actually de depends on the systole. Um, but for the kissing number, it sort of suffices to look at the large, so uh, the largest the systole is, the largest the kissing number can be in a sense. So the, the bound depends on the systole, but if you decrease the systole, uh, then the bound gets better. Uh, whereas if you look at the multiplicity of the first eigenvalue, this is no longer true. So the upper bound that we get for the multiplicity depends on the value of lambda one at the particular surface. And uh, it turns out that this, the bound that we get blows up as lambda one tends to a quarter. Uh, and it also blows up as lambda one uh, increases, uh, but that's not so much a problem because we already know that there's an upper bound on lambda one uh, that we can obtain ourselves or due to Uber, for example. Um, <coughs> so how do we uh, overcome this problem? Uh, so we have to use a different method uh, when lambda one is close to a quarter. Um, and uh, what we do there is, is uh, essentially uh, just using Savenex proof, uh, but uh, together with a bit of geometry. So Savenex proof, what it does is it uh, analyzes different uh, possibilities for what the don't nodal domains of an eigenfunction corresponding to lambda one. So that's the, the domains where the function is either positive or negative. There's two, one, one positive domain and one negative domain. And then how Savenex prove is upper bound on the multiplicity but is by anal analyzing the different possibilities for the topology of these two domains. Um, and then if you throw in a bit of geometry into the mix, uh, then it's possible to rule out some of these possibilities. And so this is something that Otal had already done. Uh, so you had proved that the multiplicity of any eigenvalue that's between zero and a quarter is at most 2g minus three, which is already an improvement on 7x upper bound of 2g plus three. Um, and again, you did this by ruling out certain possibilities. So basically, you cannot have disks uh, as nodal domains if you're in this range. Uh, and then together with Rosas, they actually proved that there's at most 2g minus 3 uh, total eigenvalues in this interval counting multiplicity. So yes, so what we did is just uh, modify this argument a little bit uh, to prove a slightly worse upper bound than Otal. So prove that the multiplicity is at most 2g minus one, but that's still an improvement upon 2g plus three of Savenek uh, whenever the first eigenvalue is between a quarter and a quarter plus a little bit. Uh, and again, this is because uh, if the first eigenvalue is in, in this interval, uh, then it's not possible to uh, have disks have as nodal domains, basically. So it uses certain inequalities in spectral geometry. Um, OK, so once we take care of the eigenvalues that are smaller than a quarter plus epsilon, and then we also chop out uh, large eigenvalues, then we're left with a certain interval where the trace formula method can be applied. And this is what we do. So again, the uh, ultimate result is that the multiplicity is at most h for every closed hyperbolic surface of genus three, uh, and that the multiplicity for the Klein quartic is equal to eight. And then one perhaps silly remark is that, well, because the multiplicity is an, an integer, uh, it makes the problem easier. Uh, just like the kissing number problem is an easier problem than the, the packing density problem. Um, 
So here, to prove that the multiplicity is less than or equal to eight, it suffices to prove that it's strictly less than nine. So there's a bit of, there's some wiggle room there uh, in our upper bounds. Uh, you know, as long as we prove is, is less than 8.999, then we're good enough. Um, and then similarly, to prove that the multiplicity of the Clank quartic is eight, it suffices to prove that it's strictly bigger than seven and strictly less than nine. And the, the upper bound was already proved by Cook, as I pointed out in the beginning. Um, so yeah, just to summarize, how does the proof go? Uh, the, we treat uh, the beginning of the interval, so from zero up to a certain value, which turns out that, that up to 1.04, um, that sort of topological method of Savinic, um, or our improvement of his method uh, proves already the bound uh, 2g minus one, uh, which is already good enough. In this case, it gives five. And then, uh, so we also need to use, it turns out, a better upper bound on lambda one than the one we can get with the trace formula methods. So there's a, a, an upper bound that's uh, due to Ross, uh, which says that it's bounded above by 2.708 something. And so in the remaining interval, if lambda one is between 1.04 and 2.71, uh, then there, uh, what we do is we apply our trace formula methods. Uh, we actually split this interval into two smaller intervals and then find some uh, test functions f using uh, optimization in order to prove that the multiplicity is, is strictly less than nine. And then the proof that <coughs> the multiplicity of the Clank quartet is equal to eight uh, is, is similar. So it uses uh, the trace formula again um, and plus some representation theory. So the, the representation theory of the isometry group of the Klein quartic. Uh, uh, so it turns out that there's few small, uh, there's few represent irreducible representations of small dimension. Uh, there's only two of dimension one, and then the next ones are of dimension six, seven, or eight. Um, and so uh, this is what Cook had already done in his thesis was to rule out uh, the, the, the one-dimensional representations uh, occurring in the first eigenspace, and then which means that the, the eigenvalues then come into packets of six, seven, or eight. So really all that was left to do was to prove that the multiplicity was strictly bigger than seven, uh, which we do using the Selberg trace formula. Okay, this is all I wanted to say. Thank you very much for your attention.